This is the section on fuels and fuel systems. First, fuels. Jet fuel. Jet engines can burn essentially anything you can run through, get into the combustion chamber. Typically, on airplanes, they're set up to run liquids, and we typically run Jet A in them, which is mostly made out of kerosene, but you could run it on alcohol and gasoline. Um, uh, you could run it on natural gas or propane if you wanted to. Um, but for aircraft, aviation fuel uh, needs a couple of characteristics, or it needs to be able to burn completely uh, so we can get better fuel economy and we also need it to burn completely so we reduce our pollution or emissions so although jet fuel jet engines could burn practically anything the engines are designed to burn jet fuel and the jet fuel is designed to be burned in jet engines to get better fuel economy and to pollute less and of course so the engine will last longer service life is talking about the engine lasting longer without having to fix it. Aviation gasoline, that is the kind, for instance, 100 low lead or uh, 100, 130, both of them have lead in it. Of course, 100, 130 has more lead. And the problem with running av gas that was designed for piston engines in a jet engine is that it's got this lead in it and the lead will deposit itself in the combustion chamber and more importantly on the stationary and on the rotating turbine blades and this lead deposits does two things first of all instead of uh, the blades being able to release heat it uh, forms hot spots actually it'll make the blade uh, keep heat in so the blades will run hotter which is not good for the engine and of course if it sticks to the surface of the blades the blades won't be the same shape as they were when they came out of the factory so it won't be as aerodynamic so the engine won't be eff as efficient typically you'll read it wouldn't it's common to read in a manual that you can run av gas with lead in it in a jet engine for say a hundred hours between every overhaul and you don't have to do anything but if you go past that hundred then you gotta take the engine apart and uh, clean the lead deposits off of the turbine section. Jet fuel is made from petroleum, black gold, Texas tea, that stuff you pump out of the ground. Uh, this is made out of molecules that contain hydrogen and carbon and a little bit of uh, nitrogen, but mostly hydrogen and carbon, hence the term hydrocarbons. There's uh, several types of jet fuel, and I'm going to make it easy for you. We're not going to memorize the uh, military designations of different types of jet fuel. We're going to say that there's uh, two basic types of jet fuel, Jet A and Jet B. Jet A is the most prominently used one in the world today, and it's made up of almost entirely kerosene with a few additives. Jet B, which we could call old school, uh, has kerosene and some gasoline in it. Of course, this gasoline doesn't have any lead in it. Um, essentially, Jet A uh, is the same as diesel in that it's mostly kerosene. D E diesel. Nope, I got it right the first time. Yay. Flashpoint. Flashpoint is how warm what temperature do you have to warm the fuel up to to where enough of the vapors across the top of the fuel will evaporate and catch on fire if we've got a barrel full of jet fuel jet a and it comes up to say something like it might be a have a flash point of minus 40 at minus 40 enough of the molecules are evaporating into the air that if you put a match down here it would catch it on fire. Whee. But colder than minus 40, so few molecules would be evaporating that you wouldn't be able to catch it on fire, even if you stuck a flame next to it. Color of jet fuel is clear or light straw colored. When I say light straw colored, I'm talking about kind of a dirty yellow and specific gravity. 
hey, specific gravity, I'm going to talk about that for a minute. A specific gravity is the weight per unit volume. Well, weight per unit volume sounds kind of like that D word. Well, that's true. It is kind of like that D word. But in, with instead of using that D word, specific gravity is comparing the weight per unit volume of something to that of water. If we set up a certain amount of water at, uh, or one kilogram Let's see, one, uh, one liter of water equals one kilogram. Wow, we have a one-to-one -one ratio. Wow, a one-to-one -one ratio. So essentially, we're comparing the weight per unit volume of something to that of water. And where they came up with 60 degrees, I don't know. It's not 59 degrees Fahrenheit. In any case, a gallon of water actually weighs eight and a half pounds. And you probably notice that, that a gallon of milk probably weighs about eight and a half pounds because it's mostly water. Probably weighs a little less because there's fat in it. In any case, here, let's get rid of these. You'll notice that aviation gasoline is significant, has a significantly lower specific gravity. That means that water per unit volume is heavier. So if we have a tank and there's water and gasoline in it, the water is heavier because it has a higher specific gravity. And you'll notice that Jet A has a higher specific gravity than fuel does, and that Jet B, since it's kerosene and gasoline, has a specific gravity that's somewhere between that of Jet A and of aviation gasoline. Now, this specific gravity that are listed here, and by the way, you do not have to memorize these numbers. You don't have to memorize these either, but you do have to memorize the order or which of these are in, uh, which of these have a higher specific gravity. Water has the higher specific gravity, half gas has the lowest, jet A is the second highest, and jet B, since it's part kerosene and part gasoline, it's going to be between jet A and ab gas. What you do need to understand is that any fluid changes its specific gravity based on temperature. This 1.0 is based on 60 degrees Fahrenheit. This uh, specific gravity of 0.8 for Jet A is based on it being at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. If we cool it down, it's going to contract. If we have a fuel tank full of jet fuel, and we take it, if it's been sitting on the ramp all day at 120 degrees Fahrenheit on a hot day in the desert, and we have take it up to altitude where it's minus 56 degrees Celsius, and I think, what's that, like minus 69 degrees Fahrenheit? I'm not sure. Minus 70. Uh, this fuel tank, let's say we didn't pump any fuel out of this tank for a while, the fuel in this tank is going to contract. It's going to get smaller. So... The, the volume will get less. Volume is going to go down, not velocity. Volume is going to go down, so it's going to have a higher specific gravity. So we have to be careful. If we went the other way around and we pumped some uh, cold gas, some cold jet fuel into a tank, and it got warmer, the temperature went up, then the volume is going to go up and the specific gravity is going to get less. So as it gets colder it contracts and there's more weight per unit volume, specific gravity gets higher and as the temperature goes up the fuel expands and the specific gravity gets lower. Now just like gasoline uh, we need to make sure that no contamination gets into the fuel system, um, especially as pilots, we're worried about the fuel injection system or the carburetor, and of course in jet engines, we're worried about the fuel control or the fuel control unit, so we're definitely going to have filters, and in fact, uh, we'll, I'll talk some more about filters later in this lesson. So definitely there's going to be filters to get rid of particles. Water becomes rather interesting in jet fuel compared to gasoline because water tends to stay in the jet fuel.
it tends to not settle nearly as much. And even if you wait four times longer than you do with that aviation gasoline, there's still going to be water in the fuel. If you've ever drained a Cessna 172 and there was water in the bottom of the tank and you drained the water out, that's water slugs. That's water that is a whole bunch of it. It's all together. And since it has a higher specific gravity than jet fuel or higher specific gravity than gasoline, it will go to the bottom of the tank and you can drain it out. So this is not a problem in jet tanks, jet fuel tanks, just like it is not a problem in gasoline tanks. Dissolved water is when there's one water molecule all by itself. One water molecule all by itself. Now if this water molecule freezes, it doesn't get, it's not any bigger. Uh, or one molecule of water is so small, it's not going to do any harm to anything. It's the entrained water that is the issue. And entrained water is, say, a gazillion water molecules are hanging out together in a globule about the size of a grain of sand, for instance. Think of it as about the size of a grain of sand. And it's floating around in the water. Now, if this liquid water freezes, that's when it's going to become a problem. It's when this water freezes that it's going to become a problem. The, if, if there is a little bit of water in the fuel tank and it gets pumped into the engine, nobody will notice. It is such an amazingly small vol percentage of the volume that you won't even notice the engine doing anything. However, if it freezes, that's where the issue becomes. If we've got those little um, sand size globules of water that have frozen, now we could clog filters and it could start damaging the components. We could damage fuel pumps and of course we're going to be really unhappy if the fuel control gets messed up so that the fuel control doesn't work correctly. So there's another thing that water does that's not so much fun. You got to understand that there's microbes and fungus mm. <laughs> living in the water eating the jet fuel. It eat They eat hydrocarbons and then they poop. And guess what? That poop is green slime. This green slime can clog small orifices. You know, have you ever noticed in a stream there's a lot of algae and stuff? You get all that goop? That's what we're talking about here. So it could clog small holes, uh, orifices in the fuel control, and the fuel control doesn't work correctly. And if you look at a fuel tank, if uh, the, in the corners of the fuel tanks have sealant in them, it uh, eats away the sealant and then, of course, you could have leaks. So we want to kill the microbes and the fungus. And we want the ice not to be there. So we're going to do something, and we're going to add, it's called a jet fuel additive. Prist is a brand name of one particular type of jet fuel additive. For the rest of your career, you're going to be reading things about jet fuel additives. There's only one kind of jet fuel additive. It's made by lots of different companies. If you call it Prist, everybody knows what you're talking about because it's the most popular kind. But all jet fuel additives do two things. One, they kill the microbes and the fungus. And two, it's got an antifreeze in it so the water won't go from a liquid to a solid at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees Celsius. It'll have to get a lot colder. So it helps prevent the ice from, from the water from turning into ice and it helps prevent the microbes and the fungus from growing. So it's very, very common to read in approved flight manuals about operating the engine with or without jet fuel additive. And of course, if you're going to be someplace that's cold, you're going to really need it. Um, and of course, Nobody likes green slime. Now, refueling. We're talking about pumping fuel into the airplane on the ground. Make sure you have a fire extinguisher available. Make sure that you ground the truck. If here's our fuel truck, the truck needs to be grounded to the ground. And if here's our airplane, yeah, I know this is a pretty trick airplane. The airplane needs to be grounded to the ground. And then the truck needs to be grounded 
to the airplane. So we actually have three bonding wires. Oops, forgot the tires. And we gotta have a little person sitting there. Little toes, little toes. Okay. No smoking. Hopefully that's relatively obvious. Even downwind, because the fuel vapors will go downwind. If you get fuel on you, it's not like your skin's gonna get irritated immediately. But if you leave jet fuel on your skin for an extended period of time, you might get a minor rash, it might itch, it might feel like a light sunburn. So if you do if you do refueling uh, and you get some fuel on your clothes, unlike gasoline, which evaporates completely, kerosene, diesel, jet A does not evaporate completely. So some of it is going to stick in your clothes and it's going to be held against your skin and it's going to rub into your skin and you're going to be uncomfortable. So if you get it on your skin, if you get it on your clothes, take uh, change clothes and wash the skin wherever you got the jet fuel on you. Okay. Transport category jets, big business jets, big turboprops and big turbine helicopters uh, have a thing called single point refueling. If you have, say, a 737 or some big biz jet, there's going to be a lot of tanks all over the place. And, yeah, pretty nice wings. I, I know you can tell. Um, it's going to be a big pain to get on top of the wing to fuel it, and there's going to be maybe two or three fuel tanks per wing. So typically what you'll see is there'll be a panel typically on the co-pilot side that opens up under the bottom of the wing and with your fuel truck, oh, I erased my fuel truck, you can run a fuel line into the open of this panel and there's a connection and it closes the hose, hooks into it so there's no air uh, can get in, no bugs, no dirt, no dust, and you can with gauges in this panel and switches you can pump fuel to anywhere on the entire airplane by just standing right here and flipping the switches sometimes somebody needs to be in the co-pilot seat and open valves to let the fuel go out to the rest of the airplane but single point refueling is based on the fact that you can hook the fuel truck up to one point on the aircraft hence the term single point refueling I think that's two. And you can refuel the entire aircraft. And the advantages are you don't have to climb up on the wings. What if it's a 747? Yeah, it's, just, you're not, it's, uh, it's not going to be that much fun on an icy day in, uh, in Chicago to have to get up on top of the wing. And besides, snow could fall in it. So you hook the fuel hose up, and there's a connector. And now you can pump fuel into the whole airplane. Yay. So the three advantages to single point refueling are one, you can pump fuel to the entire aircraft from just one point. So it saves a lot of time. You don't have to keep repositioning the truck. You don't have to climb uh, number two, you don't have to climb up on top of the airplane and accidentally slip off and fall by trying to fuel it from the tops of the tanks. And number three, you don't get any contamination into the airplane fuel system because it's never opened to the atmosphere. You can't get any snow, dust, dirt, uh, insect parts, or uh, rain inside while you're trying to pump over the top of the wing. Stick in the tank. You've probably done that with a 172 by sticking a straw in it, putting your finger over it, lifting it out, and seeing how much fuel is in the tank. That way you can have a visual indication, reasonably accurate, of exactly the volume of fuel that's in the tank. You notice I said volume. But with jet airplanes, it's going to be a little bit different. Let's say that this is the bottom of the wing, and here's the top of the wing, and the wing is the fuel tank. We've got a float. Here is the surface of the fuel, and there's this stick in here, and the stick has magnets and inside the float there's magnets so that when we unscrew this stick and start pulling it out we pull, pull the stick out it's going to come down until the magnets hit the ones in the float and then the stick will stop and then we can read the, f the fuel level here's 7,000, 6,000, 5,000, 525, 550 so this looks like it's at about 560, maybe that's 5,600 
gallons, 5,600 pounds. They're probably going to calibrate this in pounds, which is essentially telling us the height or the volume of the fuel. Now, this works out great as long as the fuel's not really, really cold or really, really hot. Oh, so, therefore, because if it's really, really cold, it'll contract, the specific gravity will be higher, or if it's really, really hot, the fuel would be bigger, its specific gravity would be less, and its volume would be greater. So we're going to have to take into account temperature. We may have to enter a chart. If we enter this chart at 5,600, we may have to come up until we hit the temperature of the fuel, not the ambient air temperature, but the temperature of the fuel might be 20 degrees Celsius, and then that will tell us how much fuel we've got in pounds and be accurate. Defueling is where you pump fuel out of the airplane. If you have single point refueling, it's really easy to reverse the fuel. Uh, you can actually pump the fuel from the airplane back into the into the fuel truck. Uh, we're used to flying a 172, or you're going across country, fill the tanks up, you don't worry about it. But if you're a transport category jet, you know, flying under 121, you don't want to carry extra fuel because you have to burn fuel to carry extra fuel. If you carry a bunch of extra fuel, you won't be able to carry as many passengers or cargo, or you'll burn more fuel than you needed just to haul it around. So defueling is when you pump fuel off of the airplane, and that's not an uncommon thing to do in the airlines is to make sure you don't have too much fuel on board. Of course, you don't get three-hour fuel reserve on your cross-country. You're only going to get your five-minute, uh, correction, 45-minute IFR reserve. So the pucker factor will go up a little bit. Fuel dumping becomes rather interesting. Fuel dumping is when you pump fuel overboard in flight. Fuel dumping is when you pump fuel overboard in flight. Let's say you take off in a transport category jet. And we'll just say that it's an A380. And so you got this big old honking airplane. And it weighs 1.235 million pounds. I was just reading this in Aviation Week. That's the max gross weight is 1.235 million pounds. Uh, but they try to save a lot of weight. So they only make the landing gear strong enough so that when you're coming into land say that it can weigh 900,000 pounds. If you land the airplane and it weighs more than 900,000 pounds, you might jam the landing gear up into the airplane. You might damage something. So they have a max landing weight. This might be max takeoff gross weight, and there might be max landing gross weight is less. So if you took off and you decided that uh, you, you ran out of Colombian coffee and you had to come back around and land. Okay, I'm making that up. Let's say an end, you have an engine failure and you need to come back in around and land. If you came back in around and landed all right away, you'd be above your maximum certificated gross landing weight. So there's more than one option here. One of them is to fly around until you burn off the fuel. But if you have an engine fire, you don't want to stay flying around. Uh, or a cabin fire, you don't want to stay flying around, so you're going to want to land. So there are airplanes that have fuel dumping systems, and you can actually pump fuel overboard. So as you're flying around, you can actually, and uh, like on a 747 or 727, they it pumps it out the wingtips. And you can actually reduce the weight of the airplane, get it down to your maximum landing gross weight, and then you come in and land and then you're not likely to damage the airplane. Now, it's not like you can't land the airplane above the maximum certificated gross landing weight, but if you do, you'll have to perform an overweight landing inspection, which if you were nice and you landed it nicely, you might not hurt the airplane. If you have any questions about fuels, you know how to get a hold of me. If you have any suggestions on how to improve this lecture, get a hold of me as well. So now, fuel systems. 
There are three basic types of fuel controls. When I say fuel controls or FCU, I'm talking about that component on the jet engine that decides how much fuel to squirt into the engine. It's similar in uh, purpose to a carburetor or a fuel injection system on a piston engine. You move the throttle lever and it decides how much fuel to squirt into the engine. There are three basic types of fuel controls on jet engines, hydromechanical, electronic, and hybrid. And they all have to put out a lot of pressure. If we have a jet engine, and we have especially a lot of compressor stages, the pressure right here is going to be really, really high. You know, it might be 300 or 400 pounds per square inch. And that fuel nozzle coming in here, if we don't squirt the fuel out at a noticeably higher PSI, then the, the airflow would actually push the fuel back in the opposite direction, so the output of the fuel control has to be a very high pressure. There is no mixture control on any jet engine ever. No one has ever put a knob in the cockpit for the pilot to control the mixture on a jet engine. The mixture is controlled completely by the shape of the combustion chamber and the fuel control making sure the right amount of fuel gets squirted into the engine. And FCU stands for fuel control unit. ECU stands for engine control unit. And talk some more about ECU as we go along. Now, this fuel control is really just a computer. If it's a hydromechanical one, it's, it's a mechanical computer, but the fuel control is taking data or inputs from a lot of places. If it's an old jet engine, it might only be taking two inputs. It might be taking these first two. Here, I'll get back to that in a second. If it's an old jet engine, the fuel control unit what you tell it from the power lever, that's like the throttle, from the cockpit, and it's measuring RPM of the engine. I've never seen a fuel control unit that didn't measure the RPM of the engine. And then based on how fast the engine's going and what you want, it'll decide how much fuel to squirt in. For instance, here's really simple. You don't have to draw this on the test. Here's the fuel tank, and here's an engine-driven pump. So it's pulling the fuel in. And it fills this up, fills this up. And if we pull this piston or plunger up or down, we can allow more fuel to go out to the engine, to the nozzles. In this fuel control, if you call this a fuel control unit, it would only have one input, and that would be the throttle. But you're going to find lots of different inputs. In fact, today's modern turbine engines, especially the transport category jet engines, have multiple inputs, and I'm only giving you examples of a few of them. It's very common for the fuel control to be measuring the temperature of the air going into the turbine, temperature of the gases going into the turbine, um, what's the pressure going into the combustion chamber, which could also be described as the compressor discharge temperature, um, Oh yeah, sorry. Compressor discharge temperature. Uh, how hot is the air just before it get, catches on fire? Compressor discharge pressure would be the same as uh, combustion chamber entry pressure, if you'd prefer calling it that way. Here is another diagram. And this plunger right here, it looks a lot like a governor on a propeller. You get to push down, and that changes the force on the speeder spring, and you've got fly weights, and the plunger goes up and down. Again, here's the fuel tank. You don't have to draw this on the test. The fuel pump pumps the fuel over to here, and fuel gets to go down to the nozzles. But in this case, we have a diaphragm right here, and the air pressure on this side is the pressure going into the combustion chamber, and so if the pressure here is higher, this bar moves down, and less fuel can escape back to the tank, and more fuel will go to the uh, fuel nozzles. So that would work out good. If we have higher pressure of air coming into the combustion chamber, we would want more fuel. So in this engine, and uh, just so you know, these flyweights on this shaft right here is getting spun around by the engine. So in this one, we have the power lever 
and we have the engine RPM and we have compressor discharge as inputs to this fuel control. And so these are just common uh, pieces of information that the fuel controller is going to use to try to decide how much fuel to squirt into the engine. Now this is not a complete list, but these are the most important ones. Fuel control outputs, that is what is it doing, what is it controlling, what, well, not, instead of what it, it's going to take information in and then it's going to do something about it. Of course the most important one is how much fuel do you pump to the fuel nozzles to go into the combustion chamber um, it's also going to control the RPMs. If you pull the power lever aft all the way back, you don't want the engine to go any slower than, RP, than idle RPM. If you have a computer-controlled fuel control, like an electronic control, in, uh, an engine control unit that's electronic, or a FADEC, full authority digital electronic control, then if you push the throttle all the way forward, it won't let you go past redline. So it's going to have to take RPM in as an information, but then it's also going to be able to control it. Again, if you have a computer-controlled fuel control, then you can just push the throttle all the way forward, and it'll give you redline power. N1 is the fan. EPR is engine pressure ratio. I'll go over it really fast. Engine pressure ratio is if you have essentially a pitot tube in the front of the engine and a pitot tube in the back of the engine, you're going to have a lot higher pressure in the tailpipe. Here's the airflow. You're going to have a lot higher pressure in the tailpipe because the velocity is going to be up and the static pressure is going to be up. So, of course, pitot tubes measure total pressure dynamic plus static. So we're going to have a lot higher pressure. Pressure in the front is going to be really high compared to a correction pressure in the back is going to be really high compared to pressure in the front. So the higher the differential, so it's going to be pressure total in the back in the exhaust divided by pressure total in the intake. And that's going to give us a number. Typically it's like two or three. In any case, uh, if you have a jet fuel control, a fuel control for a jet engine that is computer controlled and it knows what the engine pressure ratio ought to be for takeoff, you just get to push the power lever all the way forward and it decides uh, when to, how much fuel to squirt in based on not going past redline, the power setting. And of course exhaust gas temperatures, we're going to get to that, but there are uh, exhaust probes, EGT probes, inside the tailpipe and there are jet fuel controls that won't let you go past the red line temperature if the air start the gases that hit it start coming up on red line you know if we've got an EGT gauge and here's red line as the needle starts moving up it'll stop it it won't put squirt any more fuel in so you can't hurt the engine um, on old jet engines the pilot controlled had 100% control of how fast the engine RPMs went up or went down. In newer fuel controls, it's only going to let the engine slow down or speed up a certain amount because you don't want it to go too fast. If you push the power lever forward too fast and it squirts in too much fuel, then you could have an EGT go over a red line. And if you pull the fuel back too fast, the engine uh, flame might flame out. So you don't want that. So in an older engine, you got to move the power lever slow. In a newer engine, if you have an electronic fuel control, a computerized engine fuel control, then it'll take care of that for you. And then there'll be a chapter later this semester about anti-stall. It's talking about the compressor anti-stall. Those blades are fixed pitch blades. So if you exceed the critical angle of attack, you could actually have them stall. Well, there is a couple of different kinds of systems that can help prevent those compressor blades from stalling and the fuel control is what makes it happen. So this is a list here of possible, not a complete list, but the more common things that fuel controls actually do. What do they control? What are their outputs? So make sure on the test that you can tell me, you know, a test question might go one, two, three, four, five. Name six of the five different fuel control inputs or information going into a fuel control. And then the next question, of course, it'd be fill in the blank, right? would be one, two, three, four, five, six. Name seven of the six different fuel control outputs or things that fuel control actually does or fuel control actually controls. Okay, hydromechanical 
fuel controls um, are mechanical in the <laughs> okay that, that that's no points on the test uh, hydromechanical fuel controls don't have any wires don't use electricity to get their input or their output. When you move the power lever, something moves, physically moves on the fuel control. Uh, it has sensors in the engine that measure pressure and measure temperature and send this information to the fuel control mechanically. And I have a nice picture of one. This is figure 12-11 out of the Traeger. And you'll notice there's, it's a very complicated one. This shaft right here, here's the accessory section of the engine. And so this shaft is rotating. You can see some uh, flyweights. And here's a speeder spring. But there's all kinds of other stuff. There's uh, pressure coming in here. There's a pressure going out there. It says the throttle right here. So here's the shaft that moves back and forth with the throttle. Here's another uh, pressure going in here, and here's a bellows. So this will make this shaft rotate back and forth. So it's nice and complicated. But all of the controls and all of the outputs are mechanical. Here's another one. You don't have to draw this on the test. I know you wanted to. But this is the fuel control off of a JT9D. That's the first high-bypass turbofan they put on a 747 made by Pratt & Whitney. And it's amazingly complicated. There's probably six or eight different inputs and two or three or four things that it actually does. Um, and I'm not going to go into them. But interestingly enough, this looks like an automatic transmission out of a car. Electronic fuel controls can do everything that mechanical fuel controls do, but instead of getting its data via mechanical methods, via physical uh, movement or uh, physical measuring of temperature and pressure, it does it all electronically. Uh, a very common term that doesn't just apply to jet engines is FADEC, F-A-D-E-C. That's Full Authority Digital Electronic Control and FADEC is a, can be applied to piston engines as well in that you move the power lever in the cockpit, but that's really just sending an electrical signal to the computer that runs the engine. It's a computerized fuel control. And all of the inputs, the temperatures and pressures and RPMs, are given to that computer via electronic methods. And then everything it does, it sends signals out electronically to move valves and stuff like that. So here's the picture of a FADEC. It's just a box. We're talking, it's just a computer. It doesn't show it very well, but there's wires going into or out of it to different parts on the engine. And you'll notice in this picture right here, it's just bolted onto the side of the uh, fan duct. And it does all the work. Now, typically, they'll have two in here inside of this box. There'll be two computers, so if one goes dead, the other one will still work. But it's just uh, a very simple, actually, compared to a lot of computers, it's actually a very simple computer. Now, the nice thing about electronic fuel controls is they don't break as often. There's no moving parts to the fuel control, so it fails less often, or you could say it's more reliable. And since it's computer controlled, it can do everything very accurately. If it can do everything very accurately, then that means it's going to be more fuel efficient because it puts in exactly the right amount of fuel at exactly the right time. So if you are a transport category jet flying for an airline, you want to be able to dispatch that airplane every single time you want to fly it, otherwise you're not making money if you have to stop and fix the fuel control. So you're going to love that it's higher reliability. And of course, fuel costs are typically number two, number three, or number four for an airline. So you're going to be really happy if the engine burns less fuel. So guess what's getting put on all? brand new transport category jet engines, FADEX, Full Authority Digital Electronic Controls. Now, since it's computerized, you can talk to it, and it can talk to other parts on the airplane. ADC stands for Air Data Computer. The Air Data Computer, which is a very common component on transport category jets, big biz jets, big turboprops, and big turbine powered helicopters. Uh, it's measuring outside air temperature, it's measuring outside static pressure, it's measuring the pressure inside the pitot tube. And so now the engine knows exactly how fast it's going, so it can control what's going on based on speed. And the flight management system, FMS, 
Flight management system. It's hard for me to talk and spell at the same time. The flight management system or flight management computer, same thing, is just a, uh, a computer that flies the airplane makes it turn left and right, makes it climb and descend, and if you tell the flight management system or the flight management computer to descend, it will talk to the FADEC and reduce the power for you. The throttles will actually move without you touching them. If you tell the FMS to climb, it'll advance the throttles. If you tell the FMS you want to fly a certain airspeed, it will tell the FADEC, the electronic engine control, to uh, set the power setting it needs for the airspeed that it needs based on what you told it to. So having a, an electronic fuel control works out really nice in a modern jet. And then of course there are still some, just so you know, there are some engines being produced right now that are just hydromechanical. There's engines that are just electronic and then there are some fuel controls that are some hydromechanical and some electronic. So it just depends on what engine you get and when it was built. Engine driven fuel pumps. Well, they got to supply the fuel control with a really, really high pressure so the fuel control can squirt it out. You're always, always, always going to have an engine driven fuel pump on the accessory section. So if we've got our jet engine, I'm just going to draw the core. You're going to have coming off of the main shaft, the main spool an accessory section and one of the things you're going to see on there all the time is going to be the engine driven fuel pump so if the engine is spinning this will pump you're always going to see an engine driven fuel pump these engine driven fuel pumps are not electric if you the electric pumps are typically the ones that are in the tanks pumping it from the fuel tank to the engine compartment and you cannot turn this pump off. There's not a, you can shut a valve so that fuel does not get pumped to the engine. And you can turn a valve so the fuel does not get to the fuel pump. But the fuel pump is bolted into the engine. For instance, this shaft goes, here's the accessory section right here. This shaft is inside the accessory section. You can't disconnect it. The shaft coming out of this fuel pump Here's the accessory section. Uh, the shaft is stuck into the engine the whole time. Yay, fuel nozzles. I like fuel nozzles. Fuel nozzles are your friend. You'd be surprised how many people cannot spell nozzles on the test. N-O-Z-Z-L-E-S. What do we need our fuel nozzles to do? We need them to do three things. We want to get as good a fuel economy as we can. We want to have the least pollution as possible. And we want the engine to last as long as it can. Wow, sounds like the purpose of uh, jet fuel. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Now, you actually want to prevent hot streaking. Here, I'll show you what hot streaking is. It's where you wait till it's summertime and somebody's playing a football game and you take... No, no, that's different. Let's say that here's the combustion chamber and here's our fuel nozzle. Typically what you want out of the fuel nozzle is a spray pattern like this and of course the turbine blades are going to be down here. However, if this fuel nozzle, if you look, if you look up the fuel nozzle, you'll see a bunch of tiny little holes and that's where the fuel gets sprayed out of. You want it to atomize so it'll evaporate because you need the fuel to evaporate for it to catch on fire. But if some of these get clogged up partially, then you might get a stream of fuel squirting off and hitting the side of the combustion can. And so, of course, right here, it's going to get extra hot. Or it might stream the fuel all the way down to the turbine blades and still be on fire by the time it gets there because it didn't atomize and it's a stream of liquid fuel. And so this is what's called hot streaking, is where the fuel doesn't have a nice spray pattern and it doesn't atomize nicely and we get streams of liquid fuel hitting parts of the engine 
and still being burning. And of course, this turbine blade is going to be really, really unhappy. If you had really, really bad hot streaking and you looked up the exhaust oops, of a jet engine and you're looking at the blades, this turbine blade is going to be spinning around and around and around. So it's very possible that somewhere on this blade you could see a ring that's discolored. So if you're somebody's teaching you how to pre-flight a jet airplane, then what I encourage you to ask them to to show you what uh what it looks like in the back of the tailpipe and if you see a ring around the turbines, you might want to ask somebody and say, "Hey, does this look like hot streaking to you?" There are two basic types of nozzles, single stage and uh duplex or two stage nozzles. And here's what I was talking about. Really what you would want is this atomization to be going on under high pressures. And if it's a small engine, you can get away with just one nozzle. If it's two, a two-stage, if it's a big engine, two-stage nozzles, there's actually squirting fuel out of here and squirting fuel out of here. So under lower RPMs, lower power settings, you'll get this smaller but nice-shaped uh uh, fuel spray pattern, but as you push the power lever up and you get more and more fuel needed to be squirted in there, if you just make this higher and higher pressure, this might get larger and larger, longer and longer, and start hitting the turbine blades. So instead of doing that, a two stage nozzle has two sets of flames of uh, fuel spray patterns, and so both of them burn. So if you see a nozzle and you see that there's two lines go into the nozzle, then you're going, aha, this is a higher power engine, and it's going to run one spray pattern at low power settings, and at some point before you get to cruise power setting, it, the second spray pattern is going to kick in. So the spray pattern is short, and two of them that are short instead of one of them that's really long. Pressurizing and dump valves. Okay, I think I have a picture in here. All right. Okay, let's talk about a big old honking jet engine. Up here we've got a big old honking jet engine and it's got an annular combustion chamber and so right at these points right here, these are all the fuel nozzles. <laughs> all right, let's fly a jet engine that has like 50 fuel nozzles. That's my kind of jet engine. Okay, what is going to happen on this jet engine when you first start it up and turn on the fuel control unit is if fuel comes from the pump goes to the fuel control unit through the pressurization and dump valve and is fuel manifold when the fuel first starts arriving at these fuel nozzles and say here's a fuel nozzle instead of coming out in a nice spray pattern if it's at low pressure it's going to dribble out at first for the first several seconds well if all of these things dribble out what are we going to have down here at the bottom of our combustion chamber we're going to have a puddle of fuel well, puddles of fuel are fun if you have a fire extinguisher and you're a pyromaniac, but in the bottom of a jet engine, if we've got the igniters going on, we can have a f fuel of fire at the bottom of our jet engine inside of the combustion chamber. So, to prevent that, the pressurization and dump valve holds the fuel until the pressure rises high and then opens it up and lets the fuel in all at once so when the fuel actually gets to the nozzle we do get that nice spray pattern and we don't get the fuel puddling at the bottom of the engine so that's the pressurization part it, it waits until the pressure is high enough so that when fuel does go into the fuel manifold and get to the fuel nozzles it's at a high enough pressure that we get a nice spray pattern at each one instead of the fuel drizzling, dribbling down.
Now, another thing it does is when we shut the engine off. When you shut the engine down and you tell the fuel control unit, hey, stop, it shuts off the fuel so no fuel can go past it anymore. But this fuel manifold is full of fuel. Think about all the fuel in here. If it just dribbles out the bottom fuel nozzles, we're going to end up getting a puddle of fuel at the bottom of the combustion chamber. And the engine is still pretty hot from when we just shut it down, so it might catch on fire, and then we'd have a fire in the combustion chamber. So instead of letting that happen, the fuel nozzle, the correction, the pressurization and dump valve, whoops, the pressurization and dump valve will open up the fuel manifold and the fuel nozzles to overboard outside of the cowling and let the fuel inside the no inside of the fuel manifold that was next to the nozzles drain overboard. It looks like the engine is taking uh, is relieving itself. Uh, I've even seen airplanes where they'll shove a pan underneath it just so it won't get on the asphalt and mess up the uh, mess up the, the black asphalt. Uh, not every engine has this kind of a system, but you need to find out on your engine, if I shut it down, am I going to squirt jet fuel on the ramp? Now, we're only talking, you know, we're not talking gallons, uh, but it sure would be nice to know. So if somebody comes up and says, hey, it looks like your engine is peeing on the asphalt, you go, yeah, that's normal. It's supposed to do that. Or if it's not supposed to do that and it's leaking fuel, you can go, ah, it's not supposed to do that. So that's the second thing that a pressurization and dump valve does. On some jet engines, when the engine shuts down, instead of letting the fuel drain out of the fuel nozzles into the bottom of the combustion chamber and having a puddle of fuel and maybe catching on fire and having an internal engine fire, it'll allow this fuel in the manifold to drain overboard. Okay, let's see. Last thing. is if we if we tell the fuel control to stop going and oops if we tell the fuel control we're done and it shuts off the fuel and can't go past it anymore if this fuel inside the fuel control drains into the manifold or drains overboard and the fuel control is empty of fuel when we start the engine up again and this fuel control starts spinning there's definitely spinning parts in this hydromechanical fuel control then it could be damaged because the only thing that's uh, keeping this fuel control unit lubricated is the diesel fuel I mean the kerosene I mean the jet A so what we need to have this pressurization and dump valve to do is not only let the fuel go overboard from the fuel manifold, it needs to shut it off so the fuel control stays full of fuel. It's just like if you're drinking chocolate milk. Has anybody, in, if, has anybody ever drank chocolate milk? You drink chocolate milk with a straw. And when you put your mouth around it and suck on it to get the chocolate milk out, this first little bit here is air. Well, nobody likes to drink the air. So what do you do? You put your thumb inside of your mouth and close off the tube so it's full, close off the straw so it's full of chocolate milk, and you swallow what's in your mouth, and then you put the straw back in your mouth and pull the thumb away, and now this part here has chocolate milk in it. That way you don't have to pull any air in when you get going. Well, guess what? This is called keeping the prime. That, so you're not letting any air in here. So we're not letting any air into the fuel control. And the fuel control is not going to be happy if air gets in it because it's only designed to run with liquid in it. So the third thing that the pressurization and dump valve does is maintain the prime of the fuel control so that uh, it won't be damaged when it gets spin because it's got fuel in it. And it'll work correctly because there's no air in it. And then, let's see, there's something on that slide I wanted to talk about. Oh, yeah. The fuel control needs lubrication. The only thing that can lubricate it is fuel. So what you don't want to do is if you're running the engine, if you're spinning the engine around on the ground, you don't want to do it if you've run out of fuel because it might damage the fuel control. Yay. Fuel filters. 
Of course, if we have fuel fil don't have fuel filters, those little tiny holes on the fuel nozzle could get clogged up. So you're going to see fuel filters all over the place. Um, you could also damage the fuel control. It's a pretty sensitive device. So you, not only are you going to see fuel filters at the fuel tank, you know, there's going to be a fuel pump at the fuel tank. Not only are you going to see a fuel filter in the engine compartment, you're going to see a fuel filter in the nozzle somewhere just before or right inside of the nozzle because we're so worried about hot streaking and not getting a decent flame pattern. Of course if we don't get a good flame pattern it might not cause hot streaking but it's certainly going to mess up our emissions and our fuel economy. So you're going to see lots of filters in jet engine systems. Now another way to help that ice issue where there's entrained water in the jet fuel is by heating the fuel up. In fact, if you're in a Boeing 77, correction, a Boeing 727, and you're the flight engineer, you're actually going to have a fuel temperature gauge. And when it starts getting close to zero degrees Celsius, you're going to flip a switch on to start heating that fuel up. Heating the fuel up, of course, will melt the little entrained chunks of sand size uh, water so it's liquid and it won't hurt anything uh, but if we heat up the fuel by using a fuel oil heat exchanger then the fuel that's cold will actually cool the oil down and that'll work out nice because the engine oil getting pumped through the engine the parts of the engine that the oil is touching is going to get pretty good and hot and we'll talk about that in a later chapter um, but if we have to use a radiator to cool that engine oil down, we're going to have to stick it out in the slipstream and cause drag. We can put this fuel oil heat exchanger. We can run the fuel through the same device as the oil. Don't, they don't mix. You just run the tubes next to each other. So the oil temperature goes down and the fuel temperature goes up and everybody's happy and this heat exchanger can be inside of the cowling so it doesn't cause any drag so I personally like that you can also use a fuel heater where it's like a radiator on your car except a radiator on your car you blow cold air across it to cool down the coolant in this case you would take bleed air off of the compressor and of course this bleed air is somewhere depending on where you're taking it off and how what RPM you're setting set what RPM setting you're at this bleed air could be 200 to 400 degrees Celsius you run this through this heat exchanger and you let the bleed air go overboard so it's kind of a waste of energy but it does heat up the fuel in a Boeing 727 that's the switch that the flight engineer hits is to take bleed air off of the engine and run it through the fuel uh, heater just before the fuel gets into the fuel control and I already mentioned fuel temperature gauges. Auto throttles. Auto is an abbreviation for automatic. Automatic throttles. Wow, we just sit there and it does everything for us. Yay. Okay, auto throttles are only on engines that are electronic fuel controls or FADEX, full authority digital electronic. Let's see, full? Let's see if I can remember. Full authority digital. Whoops. I know got it right. Electronic controls. There we go. Um, and it'll actually move the power lever for you if it's hooked up to the flight management system. The flight management system can tell the engine how much thrust it needs and it'll do it for you. And it can set it for takeoff. It can set it for go around if you have to abort the landing. It can set it for climb. It can set it for certain airspeed or for certain Mach number. Like if you're flying across the Atlantic Ocean, everybody on the same track is about 10 minutes apart. And they'll tell everybody fly Mach 0.8. So if everybody flies Mach 0.8, you can keep your 10-minute separation. So you can actually, if you have an auto throttle, you can set it to fly a certain Mach, and you'll maintain your separation over the ocean. LRC stands for Long Range Cruise. This is very similar to economy cruise in a 172. Long range cruise is the greatest miles covered. 
for the least amount of fuel. It's the greatest amount of miles flown for the least amount of fuel. You can set it for that. Maximum continuous, that's one of my personal favorites. Maximum continuous, that's the power setting. That's the highest power setting you can run the engine at, and there's no time restriction. That is, you can leave it at maximum continuous power as long as you want. And by the way, maximum continuous power is what you typically set the engines at. If one engine quits, you set the other engines to maximum continuous. You don't have to set it to take off power. And, of course, I already said you could integrate this with your flight management system, and the flight management system could tell the fuel control what it needs. Here's a picture. This is out of uh, an MD-80 series airplane, and here's the auto throttles. Here you can see the takeoff button. Here is MCT, maximum continuous. Here's CL for climb. Here's CR for cruise. I'm sure they'd have to read somewhere and see what it is if you wanted to do a go around. And this is TOFLX, I think. So I'm not exactly sure what this button is, but I don't have that much experience flying an MD-80, so I don't feel it so bad. So this MD-80 has an auto throttle, so you just push this button, and it'll set the engines for takeoff. Sweet. You just push this button, and it'll set the engines for maximum continuous. After takeoff, you get the gear up, start putting the flaps up. You push this button, and it'll set climb set power setting for you. After you level off, you just push the cruise button, and it'll set the cruise power setting for you. Sweet. Remember, the more money you make, the less you actually have to do. If you have any questions about fuel systems, you know how to get a hold of me. If you have any suggestions on how to do this video recorded lecture better, I would enjoy hearing about it. Thank you.